Man says, Woe was it the Lord in the beauty of holiness, fear before him as the earth. Good evening, everyone. I greet you and welcome you for this Sunday evening worship service. Before beginning our service, let us all into God in prayer. Let's pray. The Lord of hosts, we thank you that you are our Father as we come to your presence. Help us to experience your fatherly love and generate your power in our spirits, soul, bodies and live the entire service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the word of God says, Praise the Lord. I praise the name of the Lord. We praise our servant of the Lord. You that stay in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our Lord. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to His name, for He is gracious. As we gather here to worship our living God, let us praise and worship to His name, because He is good. Let's all rise up to sing our God. Our God is the God of miracles. The same sound into the Lord. You will not find the melody, but you can sound to the Lord. Let's sing it together.
My mouth will speak the praises of the Lord, and all flesh will bless His name wait for our life. You all may be seated. Shall we all close our eyes to each other for various answers? Let us pray. Lord, we pray for the gospel mission of the Indian and its leaders to them who die power, lead the entire organization for the glory of God. Lord, we pray for the people who are residing in Myanmar, the military regime from the land of Myanmar, and let them enjoy the peace and family. Father, we pray for the love that is new for Russia and Ukraine. Many people have lost their life and their loved ones, and many become homeless. We pray for peace in the time of worship. May you give wisdom to the leaders of the nation to end the conflict. Savior, we pray for the many for the peace among the people also. We pray for the people living in Nigeria as they are protected by the Lord. Lord bless our ministry community. Bless teaching and teaching staff in them to help. Bless all students in all areas. We pray for today's return of Jesus. May you anoint you and strengthen you to share your living heart of God. I submit this prayer place into your mind and turn into just a little bit. Today's second scripture portion is taken from the book of Joshua, chapter 24, verses 14 to 18. Uh, book of Joshua, chapter 24, verses 14 to 18, reading from another scene. Now therefore reveal the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. Now if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the river, region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, For be it from us, that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God, who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight. He protected us along all the way that we went, and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the people, the Amorites, who lived in the land. Therefore we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. Here is the reading. Now I would like to call Professor Abhishek to come and share the big one of God. I greet you all in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, God Almighty uh, and our family for His love, care, providence, and the protection. So today uh, we are in the, uh, the other part of the nation uh, with the secured and all, but the other side of the reality is. Uh, uh, it's different. So we need to uh, thank God for His protection and all. Uh, and secondly, I want to uh, thank uh, the champion man for giving me this uh, uh, a slot to share the word of God, especially this very uh, Sunday evening. And I also I want to thank uh, uh, the team of, uh, of the group, tutorial group. I cannot name all the people because there are more than 10 plus students. So I want to thank uh, all the tutorial group for your opportunities uh, of service. And I also would like to extend my thanks to some of the friends who uh, helped us support here, especially Mr. Josh Rashwalman from BD2 and Mr. Jericho uh, for the keys and also Mr. Uh, Benny, uh, Samuel Benny for your support and also the PA operators. Uh, well, friends, uh, if you look at the text coming to uh, the text, uh, I don't know how many of you are uh, familiar with the text. Uh, so why I am using familiar because we are uh, 
theological students, but uh, we face the difficulty that uh, we find time to read the Bible. So it is very well known fact, and that is observable from uh, since my uh, studies theological journey for the last uh, one decade. So even I myself is struggling, you know, uh, to find out some. So my uh, aim or my uh, uh, will or something is that uh, to find some of the unknown or unfamiliar passages and to uh, deal with that. So when I say deal, the other word for that deal is uh, uh, for me it is a struggle. So you are a preacher or something, for me it is a struggle to preach. So I have to struggle you know, to bring something uh, for you as a theological community so that we all together may be edified uh, for the glory of God. And coming to uh, the text, uh, I think uh, it's on the thread before us. Uh, it is uh, from the book of Joshua, from the Old Testament uh, narrative, and the chapter uh, 24, and uh, 14 to 18 onwards. So here, if I ask you who is the uh, character here is, uh, you may say that Joshua. So uh, we have some Joshua's also in our uh, college, uh, you know. So why we, our parents named Joshua because they know the history and the profile of uh, the man, the great leader, uh, right after Moses, you know, from the beginning of this book of Joshua. So similarly, exactly, so Joshua is also my, uh, one of my favorite characters in the Old Testament. And if I ask you, who is this man, you may say that he was a great successor of Moses. So we need a successor in, in everywhere. So sometimes most of the leaders we find to, you know, uh, we struggle to find the successors in all the ministries today context. But God uh, never find or uh, God uh, did it find to difficulty to find the successor. So Joshua undoubtedly, undoubtedly here is a successor of Moses. And again, the next question if I throw you, so why Joshua? Why not someone else? So the questions. So we are a theological community and we are belong to the Senate of Serapur and the one you know feature of our of us is you know critical. So what is this critical? So we need to have more questions. So now the question here is you know, why Joshua and why not someone else? In the same way, so why you in the context of this theological community, why not of someone else? So the answers are maybe uh, Joshua was a skilled man, he was able to man. So just like uh, uh, Jesus, uh, you know, selected a handful of disciples. So uh, sometimes, you know, we loosely say that uh, those are, you know, those are just fishermen. But uh, I see that uh, those are not just fishermen, but uh, those are abled fishermen. So the other word for the abled is the skilled fishermen. So they are the skilled people. So in the same manner here, you know, Joshua is a skilled man, and uh, if you look at his history. Uh, under the leadership of Moses, uh, you know, he was the commander of the army and he was the uh, warrior, you know, we know very well that. So that's why maybe God called into the picture, in, into this uh, big picture to lead the nation into this uh, promised land. And uh, his original name, so for your kind information, his original name was not Joshua exactly, but it is, uh, anyone here? Anyone here, what is the original name of uh, Joshua? Yes, exactly. Yes, sir. So, Hoshia is the original name of this man. Uh, the meaning is save. So, who renamed this uh, great man? I think it is uh, the biblical scripture says that it is uh, Moses, the great leader, renamed him as Jehoshua. And coming to the book of uh, you know, Joshua in the Old Testament. So, some of the scholars equated the book of Joshua uh, with the book in the New Testament right after the Gospels, which is called the Acts of uh, Apostles. So the book of Joshua in the Old Testament is equivalent to the book of Acts in the New Testament. And coming to Joshua. So who is Joshua? And when I review some of the articles, I come to some of the facts that Joshua has some you know, a great features, a good features. For example, a man under authority, a man with a settled loyalty, and also a man with an unhindered view of God. And finally, a man is ready to serve the people. A man is ready to serve the people. So these are some of the features I have come to know. And friends, 
if i ask you what is the context here so what is the context here so without our context so we cannot go further when we deal with the text so the context here is if i ask you so joshua the chapters 23 and 24 are considered as regarded as the on a final discourse 23 and 24 are final discourse and especially the red passages you know is part and parcel of joshua chapter 24 so joshua parting speech and is also approaching the death so this is the content of this uh, uh, text and now what happened exactly here you know from the reading of the text one can say that uh, so joshua he began summarizing his life history because uh, he is facing the death and he is recalling the patriarchs you know he recalled abraham to canaan and gave him many descendants and uh, the location the spot here is shechem is the place there and now joshua time is uh, to die time to draw near and finally he is admonished people before his death and uh, he called uh, you know, people he called officers and he also killed all the uh, judges so i see that joshua has a prophet some of the scholars establish the fact that uh, joshua is also prophet so here the particular context of uh, joshua is just like a prophet you know is uh, he has a message uh, and uh, our god is being with uh, israel and he is uh, you know he goes on to describe uh, god's goodness we see from the text uh, and how god blessed is uh, israel and uh, now joshua is a challenge you know to so fear the lord and serve him in sincerity and truth and the most important problem he here is to put away all other gods so what is the problem here when you look at the text uh, you know the hypothesis is that you know people are you know having different opinions people are having different uh, you know uh, interests in terms of faith matters so joshua has the challenge here how to deal with the people and finally we see that uh, you know verse 24 uh, sorry chapter 24 and 15 there he says that uh, joshua stated the choice he and his family had made to serve the truth God urging all Israel to pray. So he had a final take on faith matters, and I and my family, so we serve the Lord of Israel. And when you look at the context here, you know Joshua in the midst of the people who are looking for other gods, and uh, so Joshua surrounded by the context where plurality of opinions, and uh, to some extent the plurality of opinions. So when I read or when I got this context, you know, I come to know that the context or the challenge facing by the Joshua in the narration plot is also identical to all of us here. So friends, we are also in the same context one way or the other way around. You know, we are in the 21st century context, and uh, you know, we need to do or we have to uh, the, do the mission or ministry. But uh, what is the context here? You know very well that the context of plurality, the plurality of opinions, and plurality of faiths. So this is what the rationale behind the, uh, selecting this passage. And uh, I try my level best to put out something uh, uh, you know good for you, so that we all can be you know learn something from here from the text. And if I ask you what is this uh, pluralistic context, you may say that you know. Uh, multi, you know, ethnic, multi-religious, multilingual, and multi-cultural identities. And uh, what is the best example, you know, to identify this uh, pluralistic context? Uh, the people around the globe, you know, they say that India is the best. You know, India is the world's most complex and comprehensive pluralistic society, harboring variety of races, variety of castes, you know, variety of you know communities, languages, customs, and uh, lifestyle. And when we located in this uh, type of context, you know, the questions uh, uh, lingers in our mindset is why so many different religions? Why so many different uh, religions? I have a big doubt here whether uh, you know is that a religion as a single word or religions plural? So may uh, we have our principal sir here? Maybe he can help us. You know? Understand is that a religion as a single word or religions a plural? So that is my a big struggle in terms of here. And the second question is, what ought to be one's attitude towards the religion? Yes. 
So we have a resistance here. So what is our uh, attitude? Of course, we are human beings, you know, and uh, from the psychological point of view or a scientific point of view, for every action there is a reaction. So we need to do something. So then only we can survive or exist on this year. And the next question is: uh, All are all religions essentially the same or different? So this is the these are the questions. So why so many religions? And uh, what is our attitude? And uh, finally, you know, for what we can do? All religions same or different from each other? So at this juncture, you know, I have to or I had to consult some of the Indian thinkers and the theologians, so, you know, to help my understanding and see what is this uh, religious pluralism or what is this context of context of plurality. The first person I found here is uh, you know very well. So Amon Thomas. Amon Thomas, I think if I'm not wrong, he basically he is from Kerala state and uh, he has contributed a lot to the Indian you know, theological movement and all. And he says that it is uh, one of his famous title, uh, Amon Thomas risking Christ for the sake of Christ. Risking Christ for the sake of Christ. And he says that, you know, for each religion, culture and ideology to recognize that people are in a situation of dialogical existence. So we are living in a situation which is called dialogical existence. So what we need to do? We need to explore the possibility of cooperation and pro-existence without in the process losing its own ultimate spiritual you know, bias, spiritual basis. So this is what, uh, you know, uh, M.M. Thomas says in his book, Risking Christ for the sake of Christ. And another person, you know, maybe uh, some of us, we know him. His name is here stated, Harold G. Howard, Harold G. Howard. And he says that, you know, religious pluralism is a special challenge facing old religions today. So the world is facing a special challenge that is what the religious you know, pluralism. So as such religious pluralism is not a threat in itself, but it is only when religions try to become exclusivist that the problems arise. So once upon a time, we know very well that you know the USA, the nation, we know the foundations of USA and uh, the leaders from the USA, and USA was an iconic nation to the rest of the world here. And once upon a time, USA was a, you know, uh, what to say, a domain of Christianity. So USA maintained the domain of Christianity. But now, today, if you go to the US, uh, you know, there is a problem of security. There is, uh, we see, the challenge of this uh, pluralistic context there. And that's what we see that, you know, when the contestants, the previous uh, uh, leader, you know, uh, Donald Trump, so one of his election manifesto is that, uh, you know, to maintain Christianity, how to you know, root out all these religious pluralism, you know, a different people have you know, entered into this land during the period of this Barack Obama and all, so there was a lot of that was one of his you know, election manifesto. So now the world is challenging, the world has a big challenge that is called the religious pluralism. And another person I have come across here is that, uh, is that Polly of Nitter, Polly of Nitter. So he says that the most pressing task confronting Christian theology today is of providing an account of existence and the renewed vitality of other religions. Yes, it's true, my dear friends. Now we are in the theological community or theological enterprise, and what is our task is that you know, you know how far the other religions have uh, contained some truth, so the vitality of other religions. So that is our struggle here. And uh, friends, you know, uh, if you look at the, uh, our uh, faith, if you look at our faith in this uh, concern, you know, the religions in the world are divided into two categories, uh, according to my understanding. So one is uh, the missionary faiths or missionary religions, and the other one is non-missionary faiths. So undoubtedly, you know, we subscribe to Christianity, and the Christianity uh, besides uh, Islam and Buddhism. Uh, you know, we have this, uh, you know, gene in our blood or something say that uh, we have to propagate our, you know, faith. So that is mandatory because we fall under this missionary faith or missionary religion. But the, in doing this mission, so the most important thing is, you know, what is the method or what is the you know, model or what is the methodology. 
So what is the method or what is the model or what is the methodology? It's very, very important. When we look at uh, the uh, Indian Christian or history of Indian Christianity, we know very well. The people who you know, came to India and started uh, the St. Thomas uh, uh, Christianity long back around 50 to 80, and then there was a long period of camp, and with the coming of these Portuguese, there are these missionaries, you know, Jesuit missionaries landed up in India, and we know very well. And when we review those missionary methods or the methodology, so we know very well that uh, so they adopted, uh, you know, they adopted the conversion. They adopted the conversion model. In other words, to simplify what is this conversion model, baptism first and teaching next. So baptism first you have to baptize the people and give a seed. If you don't baptize the people, there is a, another group that uh, is coming forcefully to take it into the other faith. So that was the struggle, you know, the missionaries uh, faced and they adopted this conversion model or conventional model, baptism first and teaching next. But now we are in the 21st century context, so can we apply the same methodology, can we adopt the same thing or do we need to come up with, this, with something new or something different which suits best to this 21st century context. So in this uh, you know, context, uh, so there is no person, there is no one except uh, the one person who is recorded in the Bible who was connected to see Jesus. So now then I switch to uh, this uh, Jesus, you know, Jesus public ministry and movement uh, and when I come to know, so what is the methodology that, uh, you know, Jesus used in his own period is uh, nothing but uh, the, uh, what to say, the transformation model. So that's why there are two models which are recorded in the Bible. One is a conversion model and the other one is a transformation model. So Jesus in uh, Luke chapter 4, from 18 onwards, we know the Nazareth Manifesto is considered as the transformation model. So Jesus has this model, the transformation model. So what is Jesus thought in his mind? Some of the people says that mission is not simply the conversion of individuals, but the transformation of the corporate life of the whole community. So he goes on. Some people says that it is not the transformation or conversion of individuals, but the transformation of the corporate. And another thing, another scholar, you know, from the Indian theological movement, as J. Samantha, we know very well. And he says that the mission is continuing activity through the spirit, but what, what is the purpose? To mend the brokenness of creation, to overcome the fragmentation of humanity, and finally to heal the rift between humanity, nature, and God. So that is what the uh, mission, according to this. Uh, as J. Samantha. And uh, the next person, you know, I come across here is Wesley Arirajan, who was the director of the Dialogue Unit of WCC. He says that, you know, the Christian is not called to convert but to witness. The Christian is not to convert the people, you know, but to witness. And then, you know, there is also, it seems that NCCI, the official forum for the non Catholic churches. So there, there the statement is that. Uh, Christianity in India does not need more members, not the numerical growth of the membership of the growth. Church, who is in the spirit of Christ, ventures out to spread the good news. What is our job here? To spread the good news through their humble lifestyle and service. Humble lifestyle and service. So what is the job of the church here? The church will spread the good news through humble lifestyle friends, after consulting all these things, then I come to the person you know, from the scriptures that is called a Joshua. So Joshua. So Joshua was, uh, you know, dated back, you know, uh, to some, you know, centuries. But uh, he had some model, he had already some methodology, how to deal with the people with the plurality of faiths uh, or plurality of interests. So these are the concluding uh, remarks for you, friends. So mission or ministry is our mandate or it is a command, or it is an obligation, undoubted, there is no doubt. But what is the method or what is the approach which is suits best to our context of plurality? So we need to think, so, so as you are graduated, as you are graduating students, so you face the reality outside, you face the reality. So there, how to do, how to do mission. So 
you and I need to have a method or an approach or a methodology how to do the ministry. So that we need to find out that is our struggle. And uh, the context of plurality cannot be avoided, but to deal with it positively or constructively. If you have the frame of that, the Holy Sir is, you know, is also the God of plurality. So someone says that uh, what is this plurality? So one of the famous, uh, uh, one of the famous Christian apologists, you know, Dr. Ravi Jagadhyay, he says that the beauty of plurality. So what is plurality? It is uh, the beauty. It is the beauty. So from the Joshua's perspective, people do not have the power to choose for themselves. They don't do have the power to choose for themselves religiously. So when we come to the text, how G, how Joshua is handled, the handling the people is that uh, Joshua is giving a freedom to the people to choose themselves. So that is what something is striking in my mind when I deal with this uh, kind of particular text. So Joshua, leader of Israel, is well matured enough. To handle people and confuse it with the people, so confuse it with the plurality. So, this is what I come to know. And finally, Joshua, with all the powers and authority, recognizes that people has the power to choose the real God. So, Joshua, being the leader of Israel, so he is well matured and well structured, you know, and has a well frame of reference that people has the power to choose themselves who is the real deity or real God. He never mishandled and handled anyone in terms of it matters. So this is what uh, I see that. So Joshua was never mishandled or manhandled anyone in terms of it matters. Today we see that uh, there is a lot of uh, Christian community, you know, friends of our faith, uh, you know, getting uh, arrested. So why they are getting uh, arrested? Uh, why they are getting arrested? So we need to review, you know, carefully. So Joshua here, he never mishandled or manhandled anyone in terms of faith matter. And uh, the biggest thing here is that uh, so Joshua being the leader of Israel, he was never imperative. And he was never demanded. He was never forced or he never you know, abused or compelled or dehumanized or devalued because he knows that the value of the people. And the people have, they have a right to choose what they like to serve. So people have a right to choose, you know, what they like to serve. And Joshua, well aware the fact that he did not have a right to violate the freedom of others. Yes. So Joshua is very well, you know, uh, at the fact that he did not have a right to violate the freedom of people in faith matters. So he did not, he did not take it to the job. And imagine, friends, you know, in conclusion. If you and I were given power or authority to perform some task, you know, how we would act upon the people with the plurality of interest. So when people are there, people have a you know, different interest. So that's why here we see that plurality of interest, you know, plurality of opinions, and plurality of our rights, and plurality of confessions, and plurality, they have different commitments. So we are all here as a you know, family of BBC. So we should not think that, you know, of course we all have one commitment, but within that they have, you know, sub-commitments. Within that we have, you know, we all have different. You know? So we, you know, we need to, you know, uh, we need to honor or we need to respect, you know, your commitments. So plurality of interests, plurality of opinions, plurality of rights, plurality of conditions and commitments. So friends, you know, what usually happens? The natural tendency is that, you know, with our premature understanding or premature knowledge, we are in some other activities to ministry and mission and dilute the original premise of what is mission and the ministry. So please do not, you know, dilute, you know, what is the original premise of mission or ministry. So friends, you know, our call finally, our call commitment ministry mission is not to order, is not to command. Is not to you know, threaten, is not to force or not to compel people, you know, to act or perform upon our own motives and interests and commitments. So this is very, you know, the funny thing. How you would, you know, do something according to my own task or my own target. So that is, you know, very very funny thing. So this is what the lesson I learned from this uh, Joshua. And Joshua here, what I noticed here is that Joshua is not working here to satisfy God. So. Joshua is not working here to satisfy God at the backdrop of forcing others, but what he is doing rather 
forcing others to use the bleeding. So the one beautiful verse, you know, I picked up from, from this version is that uh, he is urging people. He is urging, he is requesting, you know. So rather than forcing, he is pleading, he is urging people to make a right decision or a right uh, choice. And those who are finding it. So what is my fi final concluding remarks on this uh, a biblical great leader, character Joshua is, he was truly a cool personality. So that is what I noticed. He was truly a cool personality, managed the situation of polarity, and he was uh, successful. So there is a homework for you when you get back to your rooms. So please read the chapters 23 and 24 to understand more what I have shared with you from the last couple of minutes. So he was, uh, I see that he was uh, successful, and in the end, uh, he passed away in the state of uh, of course, he passed away. And then I see that uh, we see that he passed away in a state of peace and tranquility. So he passed away towards the end, you know, with a state of peace and tranquility. So the biggest question for you and is that we are also doing this. So we are also in the midst. So we have the daily activities, we have our own tasks, responsibilities and all. But towards the end of the day, what you have to do, you have to go to bed, you know, we need to go to bed with a peace of mind and tranquility. So what is the, you know, what we, what is the benefit if we don't have this future? So I see in the end, so Joshua, he passed away with, you know, the state of peace and tranquility. So the biggest question here is, how do we maintain peace and tranquility, even though we are in the context of morality? even though we are in the context of plurality. Friends, you know, to understand this context of plurality, we have no need to go to outside the seminary or the campus or the boundaries. So we observe, we notice there is, you know, the existence is that plurality exists uh, within ourselves. Different of interests, different of opinions, different of rights, different of, you know, so there are so much. But within this uh, plurality, pluralistic context, uh, how do you, you know, maintain the peace and I got the Thank you, sir, for sharing the insights from the Lord of God. Now, we will have a special song in the offering to be Thank you. Sir. The song is I going to say this. I choose the Jesus way. I choose the Jesus way. If you know the same way. Yeah. 
Let's pray. Father, who has blessed us abundantly with riches in Jesus Christ, we thank you for blessing the fruit of our labor and helping us to offer a small portion for your glory. Thank you, Lord, for moving in our midst, listening our praises, and filling our hearts with your holy word. May your presence abide with us as we depart from your sanctuary and love us. Always with your unconditional love. In Jesus' name we pray, our Father. Amen. Let us all rise and pray the last prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let's receive the benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Shalom.